Hi, it's Jessica Halloran from The Australian. Thank you for listening to The Breakdown. This podcast is made possible with the support of The Australian subscribers. Subscribers can hear the full series now via The Australian app. They also have access to our sports coverage and analysis on all devices. To see our subscription offers, visit theaustralian.com.au slash subscription. This is The Breakdown, the story of how the game, with all the money, ended up broke. I'm Jessica Halloran, Chief Sports Writer at The Australian. Editorial Director Claire Harvey and I have gone deep to find out what went so wrong in Australian Rugby Union. It's not pretty. Uh, I was sorry. <laughs> Just remembering it now. It was a great shame that, that we lost Israel Folau, I think. But we have a problem that the Northern Hemisphere people run the game. They don't give a shit about the Southern Hemisphere. Couldn't give a stuff. I, I said I'm not from Osman, I'm from Blakehurst. Um, I played for the Blakehurst Blues and my club no longer exists. We used to teach the world how to play rugby. Now, we're mendicants, we're, we're begging people to play us. I just had to cut the umbilical cord. I, I couldn't be a part of the game without a, some bitterness. I did say to him, just make sure you don't allow them to piss it up against a wall. Whoever owns the players owns the game and the players will go where the money is. Sexism? Sex- oh, God, yes. <laughs> yeah. How would you describe where the game is at, at the grassroots? Um, catastrophic at the moment. Russell Crowe is one of the world's biggest movie stars and Gladiator was his biggest hit. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the North. He won an Oscar for that role. Even movie stars have sporting heroes and in the early 2000s, who did Russell Crowe look up to? A rugby union player. I had a shop at The Rocks and um, many, many years ago, and uh, Russell Crowe's personal trainer would come in and and in the shop I had all my jerseys. So I had uh, Hugo Porter, Serge Blanco, Yay Nevin. This is David Campisi, Australia's greatest ever try scorer. He played 101 tests for Australia. He was the Wallabies' first ever superstar. All the plays I played against, jerseys mounted. So she came in and said, oh, Russell loves rugby. I said, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, how much are they? I said, no, nah, not for sale. And I said, okay, I said, well, tell Russell if he can give me something out of one of his movies, I'll give him one of my jerseys. He said, okay. Anyway, so I gave Russell my jersey from the New Zealand game in the World Cup 91 against New Zealand's. And I gave him a Jonah Loma jersey. So anyway, so I was walking to work one day and there was a limousine across the road and came across it. So Russell carried it and he actually gave me the gladiator mask he wore in the movie. So I've got some, I've got some very interesting <laughs> memorabilia at home, I tell you. So this moment really shows where Australian rugby and David Campisi were at. The fact Russell Crowe was willing to give Campo his mask, it says so much. It's pretty amazing, right? But it's easy to understand why Rusty loved Campo back then. Because back in the 80s and the 90s, David Campisi had played his way not only into the hearts of this nation, but really the world's. Campisi. He's gone through, and that's his 35th try. He's going to score. Oh, what a try from New South Wales, and it's too easy for David Campisi. Here's it once more. This is brilliant rugby. Feynman on the goal. Tackled by God. It's Campisi going. I don't think John Beattie can catch it. And there is another marvellous Australian try. Sure, Australian rugby had plenty of big names. Simon Poitavin, Nick Barr-Jones, Michael Liner, the Eller brothers. But it was Campo's football that had the game growing at every level. Campo was a star on a star team, the kind of player imitated by kids in backyards and local parks. In the off-season, he was a draw card for Milan in the Italian league, a competition that was attracting investment in the 1980s from brands such as Benetton. And with it, big-name players from the South. He once said in 1991, five years before the game turned professional, I'm still an amateur, of course, but I became rugby's first millionaire five years ago. Campisi played an explosive game that set him apart. By Jones. Campisi. David Campisi. David Campisi all the way. A great try. 
away from the leading try scorer in world rugby, David Campisi, came across and simply skated through the all-black defence. Every second kid wanted to be a Wallaby. <laughs> Look, fellas, lift your heads. If we want to win this, we've got to run the ball. So what do we want to be? Wallaby. A wallaby. 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 To look back now at Campo's games is like watching magic. One player is on fast forward while everyone else is in slow motion. The young Campo is so fast and elegant that commentators don't have time to actually describe what they're seeing. Campisi coming to on Stringer. Ball knocked on. And Campisi! David Campisi! Underwood chasing! He had even worked himself into the language. Remember, too easy, Campisi? What I could do is I could sidestep, I could swerve, I could do the goose step, I could chip and chase, and I could pass. So watching somebody who could do one thing to watching someone who can do five things, I thought, well, he's not sure what I was going to do. And it made them a lot more pressure on them than me. Understand the game, understand communicating. Um, um, I had a great relationship with uh, Nick Farr Jones and I played my number nines, number 10, Michael Liner. Uh, they knew where I was. I would talk to him. I want the ball. And... They knew if I wanted it, there was something happening. I just didn't call for the sake of calling. But it was just wanted to get involved, you know. But I practised. Um, I played Aussie rules so I could kick like an Aussie rule player. I kicked up and down. I didn't kick around. Uh, torpedo, the best kick in the world. Um, and just just trying different things. Just being, just being me, I suppose. Campisi has never held a full-time coaching role with a pro team here in Australia. He hasn't coached for the Wallabies or even at super level. He's coached overseas, though. He's coached in Singapore, Japan, New Zealand, Tonga and was the skills coach for the Sharks in South Africa. Does he want to coach in Australia again? He sure does. In fact, when COVID hit last year, he called New South Wales Rugby. Left a message for the uh, New South Wales new CEO and listen... If you want me to come and help some of the young guys get their skills up during COVID, I'll come and help. Never heard a thing back. So what, what do you, you know, you can only offer, which means obviously they're not interested. I should have got the message then that no one's interested. You know? He tells me he's at the stage in his life where he wants to pass on his knowledge and wisdom to the next generation of players here. And the reason why is that he feels Australian rugby has lost its way. He sees that the Wallabies are not revered or as respected as they once were. Campo says it's disappointing, not just for him, but for all the fans who remember how it used to be. Um, I just think we just need to to get the the culture back. I think that's important. I think we've lost our culture. Um, players have got no idea who we are. The kids have got no idea who we are, where we came from. Uh, Randwick Rugby hasn't even got a club anymore. They've sold the club. There's nothing. So after the game, where do the kids go? I mean, the All Blacks have got culture. They live on culture. And traditions. We, what do we live on? We haven't got that. And, you know, it was strange from a guy who went to a government school, had no idea about rugby, and I'm talking about culture. No one got, oh, they've got no idea who we are. We walk around like anyone else. We're rugby league, they promote them. You know, everyone knows who Billy Slater is. They know who Wally Lewis is. They use those, Alfie Langer. They know those players. But in rugby, who are we? But hold up. Let's just go back to the fact that Australia's greatest ever try scorer can't get a full-time coaching job here. It's no secret that Campisi in the past has been an outspoken and uh, controversial voice, and perhaps that has cost him. So it just I don't know how that all works up when you know you've played for so long, you've got so much knowledge of the game, and yet you know you, you struggle to get involved. Uh, maybe because I was very outspoken back in my day, I don't know. Because uh, Lara, my wife, says I must have really peed off a lot of people because it's, you know. Uh, but but that might have been right, you know. But I mean, back then you you're cocky, you're confident, you're arrogant because you know you won World Cups and you you played well. Uh, but obviously, people still remember those that days, which is sad. But um, like I coached in South Africa, uh, coached in Singapore, coached in England when I go across. Um, went over the Western Force a couple of years ago, did a session with their team. So you get involved, um, but it's 
it's it just seems to be a different sort of network these days. Um, and yeah, look, I, I understand that's that's the way it goes, um, but. You know, I, I still find it strange that rugby league bring their players back in once they retired, Aussie rules or cricket, where in rugby it's it's very, for some reason it's like, no, the old boy, school boy network, you were part of that era back there, we've moved on. So, and look, I, I've, I've come to, to realise, like, you know, they don't really want our help, so if I can help other ways and uh, maybe you have to look at other things to do in life, you know, because it's... You can only do. You can only try so much. You can only get knocked back so many times. So, you know, you got to just sort of be realistic and say, well, you know, try and uh, get out there and, and do other things. There's some who have said he has difficulties as a coach because he was so naturally gifted. But to that, Campisi has said he was also an incredibly hard trainer. Campisi's situation is part of a bigger question: what the hell is going on in Australian rugby? Last year, the code was $20 million in debt. Clubs in the bush are dying. Clubs in the suburbs have gone too. There's a whole wave of kids coming through that can't name a wallaby. They used to pack over 100,000 fans into stadiums. Rugby in Australia is a mess. The grassroots. That's where you'll find David Campisi coaching these days. Today you'll find him up in Newcastle or over in Randwick helping out women's and men's teams. You will find him down at the local park coaching kids wanting to be a wallaby or a wallaroo. His passion for the game is very, very evident. He knows what's happening at the game's grassroots. Two years ago he had a part-time ambassador gig where he would run coaching clinics for kids and local level coaches. And what he saw at the grassroots shocked him. I've been coaching for the last two years with Rugby Australia and the classic Wallabies around the country, coaching kids, coaching coaches, um, having a connect with, the, you know, being an older player, the younger kids. Um, but a couple of questions I do after training, I ask the kids, you know, I'll ask one kid, what's your name? He said, Johnny, what position, number 10, who's your favourite player? Haven't got one. OK, uh, ask someone else. They normally probably say Kiwi. And I find that strange. They, they're playing rugby, but they don't know who the players are or they don't want to be like somebody. Anyway, for two years I did this, and um, it was scared that nobody wanted to know what I found out there. As Campo said back then, nobody wanted to know. I think this simple moment explains the incredible disconnect that has been occurring between the head office and its fans. Uh, my name is Sateki Tui Polotu. In Western Sydney, Teki is Mr Rugby. Teki is the president, the chief selector, the coaching director and many other things at the Blacktown Scorpions Junior Rugby Union Club. He runs the rugby program at Hills Sports High School, an exceptional sporting high school in Sydney's northwest. He's also running the rugby program at a private school, St Andrews Cathedral School. He has 50 test caps for Tonga. He's been to three World Cups for them, coached their sevens team. He's played club rugby in Australia, South Africa and England. He's been a club coach across Sydney. He gets it. Don't get me wrong, I grew up playing rugby league. But then I went to on a tour with New South Wales School Boys to uh, New Zealand for two weeks and I came back, that was it. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was alignment with my values mm. and my mm. the way I think and the way I've been brought up. So that's what changed me. Uh, and I loved it ever since. And the reason why they call it the game played in heaven, you know, because it is. Mm. Uh, you know, the beauty of it doesn't matter where you go around the world. Mm. You're very welcoming to any... <clears throat> Rugby yep. cycle, but it's also uh, rugby is life, you know, and that's why um, I love it so much. One of the clinics David Campisi did was at Techie's club, the Blacktown Scorpions. Oh, absolutely. His, uh, his basic core skills and his knowledge and understanding of the game and obviously presenting it, uh, unbelievable. The young players thought Campo was amazing, but they had no idea who he was. And he came and took a photo with... Um, Blacktown Scorpion girls, and I said, do you know who this uh, man is, taking a photo? And all the girls said, no, I don't. Oh, yeah. So which tells me that's the same. Yeah. You know, and I explained to him, this is one of the greats of Australian rugby. At Junior Games, Techie sees a lot of scouts from Rugby League. So I see Rugby League scouts at Rugby Union Games, but I don't see Rugby Union scouts. Huh. You know, uh, vice versa. 
I mean, if Leek's doing that to, to, to the rugby, he goes, why can't we uh, rugby union scouts have a look at rugby league players? OK, let's talk about race. There are plenty of Pacifica players in the Wallabies and Super Rugby. Dave Rennie, the Wallabies coach, is a Kiwi with Cook Islands heritage, but he's the exception. There is a glaring absence of Pacifica people in leadership roles at the top of Australian rugby. Teki feels this really keenly. He's not holding a grudge or demanding special treatment, but he says it's an issue. There's a lot of things. I mean, oh, look, I know a lot of people might get upset with me in, in saying this. Uh, I still feel, um, you know, and I'd be straight up, and to be honest, I feel there is a bit of, still a bit of racism concerning um, uh, Polynesians and also white people. So Polynesian involved, I get it. I still feel there is a bit of racism um, and discrimination here in Australia. Mm. So it is pretty hard. Uh, and it's saying that, look, there's a lot of them, you know, taking policy, I get it. Mm. Well, but I know myself that obviously um, throughout the years, I've, I've, I have had a fair share of my own. Mm. And that's why I'm speaking from experience. Mm. What have you endured here in Australia? Well, I've endured, you know, avenues where I could have gone up concerning coaches, but I've been knocked back. I'm sorry about that. No, no, don't be sorry. Mm. I, looked, I think there's a reason for everything um, concerning, um, uh, you know, what I am. I'm grateful for what I do. You know, I'm not going to hold any grudges. You know, it is what it is sometimes, and sometimes I've got to take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, but I shouldn't have to. Mm. Mm. You know, uh, I don't have to. Well, I work as hard as everyone else does. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I've got to work twice as hard. I mean, how many hours are you putting into that club at the moment? Oh, at this club, I'll probably put in probably um, at least probably 50, 50 to 60 hours. <laughs> wow. You know, uh, I do get tired, don't get me wrong, but I look at the kids and I'm very passionate about kids. But is this just about race or is it about any kind of outsider? You've got wide, affluent, boys' club, private schools. That's powerful player agent, Coda Nasser. He manages the career of that incredible footballer, Sonny Bill Williams. Now here's Sonny Bill Williams, offload. And also, Quay there for Cooper. Genia, though, and somehow he gets it away to Cooper. Cooper showing and, and going. Cooper, Cooper dummying. Quay Cooper, absolutely brilliant. Cooper, the immensely talented fly half, has 70 Wallabies test caps. In 2013, he dubbed the Wallabies environment toxic. He was fined $40,000 for doing so, and Coda reckons he has never recovered from it. He made a remark about toxic environment, and that was the end of him. So if a player that can't even talk or uh, express himself, then it's then it's uh, you don't have an environment that allows expression, clear expression of what you really feel. It tells you what kind of modern dictatorship you live under. In 2017, despite his impressive ability. He was sensationally dumped by the Queensland Reds. Cooper's currently playing outstanding rugby in a leadership role in Japan's top league. I just don't think rugby has an ability to deal with uh, outsiders. Mm -hmm. And and outsiders means anyone who doesn't come from basically a white private school background. And it's evident because if you look at the the players of Polynesian descent, Pacific descent, you know, more than 50% of them what, 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 what do you see on board level? Who actually fights for them on a board level? What coaches do you see? What assistant coaches do you see? What CEOs do you see? What player liaison officers do you see in that field? You won't see anyone. And if you do, it's a token person. Well, look, uh, in, in the last 10 to 15 years, he's got the best record of any flyer. Win, win percentage. And he was always seen to be fighting for his position. Do you think it's racism? I just told you facts. Mm-hmm. More than 50% of your constituents are black, Polynesian, and you don't have any any positions of influence or any positions of decision-making. What do you think that is? Fair play? Coda's forthright, but he rarely gives interviews. This is the first time he's spoken on this issue. And the Aboriginals are some of the most talented rugby players we've ever had. Mm-hmm. Where are they? Doesn't that tell you? Where are they? 
Why, why don't the Aboriginals feel free to play this game that they're so great at? Coda says the game needs to look to South Africa, the reigning World Cup champions. In an attempt to address the disgraceful legacy of apartheid, the Springboks agreed to a racial quota system. The government made sure there was what you basically call a quota system of black players coming through. Um, in the last World Cup, they made the semi-final in 11. In 15, I think they also got to the semi. I mean, and they just won the World Cup in a, in, in a fantastic style of rugby. Um, Colby's try is still implanted in your head the way he scored. And losing it, arms there, pops up in a toy. Here comes Chosen Tiding. Colby bounces towards the fence, beats one, still going. Chosen Tiding, Chosen Colby, South Africa, the World Cup is theirs. It's a great moment for rugby worldwide, and uh, it's an example of what can happen under strong leadership of, you know, trying to make it inclusive for everybody. Before I wrap up with Coda, he also told me this startling fact about Sonny Bill Williams. It goes back to when SBW left the Bulldogs and went to play rugby in France. Sonny Bill played rugby league here since the age of 15. Mm -hmm. If ARU was doing its job, don't you think when they knew that he was going to Toulon, they could have grabbed that? They could have had the first crack at him? But obviously their recruits, the people that judge what a rugby player should be and how a rugby player should mm. play, yeah. uh, they've got no idea, no foresight, no intelligence, nothing. Yeah. No accountability, nothing. nothing. Yeah. So, so could have Sonny Bill played for the Wallabies? Are you saying that? Well, well, well I'm saying that the discussion could have happened, that the All Blacks came, uh, he, uh, he came and visited him. Do you know what I mean? The Wallabies could have visited him before. Hmm. <laughs> You yeah. know what I mean? That, that, that discussion could have happened. Mm. Mm. Like Israel Folau could have played for Tonga. Mm. He could have played for the Kiwis as well. I know that the Kiwis were courting him. I know the Kiwis are courted many players. You know, you've got to, you've got to have people with foresight, intelligence yeah. in those positions, people that care. Sonny Bill won two World Cups with the All Blacks. But rugby hasn't always been in this fractured state. The game was in a really great place for a very long time. 30 years ago, the game they play in heaven was really starting to fly. A group of amateur footballers, the Wallabies, had won the hearts of the nation. Kepler, brilliantly won. Ella, Mark Ella takes it up. Line up. Oh, man taken out of the play. Matthew Burke. Campisi. Campisi. Mark Ella, what a try. Superb try from the Australians. All from Mark Eller's work, taking it right up to the Irish defence and putting Michael Liner through a lovely gap. The 1984 Grand Slam Tour was the moment in the modern era where Australians really started to sit up and take notice of the Wallabies. Of course, there'd been great players and moments in the game before this, but it was around 84 the game started to creep into the national consciousness. The 1984 Wallabies did something their previous teams to Britain and Ireland couldn't do, and that was to win the Grand Slam. They nailed victories over England, Ireland, Wales and Scotland. The coach at the time, a former school teacher, Alan Jones. See, we taught the world how to play with the football. And after all, that's what it's about, isn't it? You know, the ball goes through your hands faster than it goes through the air. That's why I'm not in favour of cut-out passes. The ball travels through your hands faster. Alan Jones is right. They changed the way the game was played. The way the Wallabies ran the ball was nothing like anyone had ever seen before. They played the game fast, and that tour saw the rise of two extraordinarily talented players, David Campisi and Mark Eller. Eller was once described as the detonator. Mark Eller, liner to Eller. Mark Eller! Mark Eller! Oh, what a great try to Australia! His second try in Test Match Football, and Australia's in the lead. We're starting this podcast focusing on David Campisi because his story illustrates so much about rugby union. David Campisi didn't go to some fancy boarding school. He grew up in the small country town of Queanbeyan, outside Canberra. Look, playing in a country town, I played Aussie Rules, uh, won a golf championship at 15, um... Just a typical country town. All you can do is play sport. We ran the streets. Campo's parents were Italian immigrants. They didn't care what game he played. 
Campisi found himself playing every sport he could, but mostly rugby league. My background is I uh, played rugby league most of my life, so been involved in rugby from 79, playing fourth grade in Queanbeyan, uh, which I played league most of my life. So I just went over and after the game asked the coach that I need a fullback. He said, yep, started. That was it. That's how I started playing fourth grade, 79. First grade in 1980, uh, ACT 21's 81, Wallabies 82. So I didn't go through the system, which has always been a bit of a problem, I think, for a lot of uh, administrators, not going through the schoolboy system. In just three years, he went from Queanbeyan's fourth grade team to the Wallabies. Rugby Union showed him the world. My dad's Italian, came out to Australia, no idea about sport, <clears throat> no idea. I had an elder brother and two younger sisters. Lived in a small house, two-bedroom house, um, and that was life. We got on with it. Then I get, I get to go with Alan Jones. Before embarking on this Grand Slam tour with Alan Jones, the Wallabies had suffered a devastating 25-24 loss to the All Blacks. That loss had forced Jones to make some significant changes to his team. He brought in Michael Liner, Steve Cutler, and a sandy-haired young player by the name of Nick Farr Jones. Remarkably, Nick Farr Jones had only seen one rugby test live before this Grand Slam tour. I suppose the unusual thing when you think about 84 and debuting or becoming a Wallaby and playing my first test was that I only watched my first rugby test the year before I played one. So I saw, I went out and watched the Wallabies play Argentina in 1983. So Far Jones hadn't really played a lot of rugby union either. Like Campisi, Far Jones hadn't grown up playing the game. He played soccer in the Shire. He went to Newington, a top private school, but he didn't play in the first 15. Yet, in 1984, he found himself on his first rugby tour, a 10-week trip away to the UK and Ireland. But It was just fantastic, 18 matches. Go away with guys who, you know, I idolised to get to play alongside people like Mark Eller. Um, it was just fantastic to have Andrew Slack as my first captain. Alan Jones, obviously, is my first coach. It was, it was fantastic. Far Jones said Alan Jones was brilliant. He knew how to get the best out of you. Uh, I think that was, he had great wisdom. Um, and he knew, for example, you know, Nick might need a kick up the bum, whereas Michael Liner might need a bit of an arm around the shoulder. Jones also took a shine to the roguish Campisi. He was a live wire who admittedly lived a pretty sheltered existence in that country town of Queanbeyan. He went from running around the country streets to hanging out with the Queen, all because of rugby union. Then I get, I get to go with Alan Jones in 84 Grand Slam. We go and see Julie Andrews in concert. I knew who she was, I didn't do that. Then you go to see Shakespeare's house, Stonehenge. You go into, we went to see the Queen twice in Buckingham Palace. Um, I went to live in Italy. I went to the Colosseum. Campisi's fame was well earned on the field. Even today, 25 years since he retired, with 101 test caps, no Australian player has come close to his record of 64 career tries. While Campisi was brilliant during that 84 Grand Slam tour, he really shone in 1991. There were two key moments in that 1991 World Cup campaign which illustrated how potent he was on the field for the Wallabies. He helped dismantle the All Blacks in the semi-final. He was at the heart of everything. Here is the call of Campo evading a bunch of defenders to score the opening try at Lansdowne Road. By Jones, Campisi, David Campisi, David Campisi all the way! Great try from the leading try scorer in world rugby, David Campisi, came across and simply skated through the All Black defence. Campisi was part of what the British press labelled the Wallabies' Holy Trinity, along with Nick Farr Jones and Michael Liner. They were quite the combination, especially Farr Jones, the quick thinking number nine, and Campisi. It's been calculated that Farr Jones created 46 of Campo's 64 test tries. He was, he was fantastic. I mean, I, I suspect I probably played about 55 tests with him, um, maybe a few more. But he was different. I mean, he, was, he, he could do things that no other player could do. I mean, I... But Far Jones was, and remains today, one of the only people that really understands David Campisi, on and off the field. The communication I had with Camper um, 
was unique and very good. Um, so I was often the last pass or the last kick before you know a try. But Campo left you in no doubt when he wanted the ball, and you knew about the ability of the guy. And when he wanted the ball, you'd you'd get it to him. And so you know he was a he was a unique winger in that he would do things totally against the rule book. Um, you know Bob Dwyer would say, "Do not run across field. You run straight to create space and you know draw defenders to you." But Campo liked that first. Um, test try in the semi-final against New Zealand in Dublin, ran perfectly across field. But he came from the right wing, I hit him running left, um, and he proceeded to run it past about six or seven All Blacks. So he was that sort of player that could just do unique against the rule book type of play. But I knew, you know, when he needed the ball, he could see something happening. And invariably, I'd get it to him somehow. That play by Campisi has been described as a moment of genius. But there was also another moment of Campese brilliance in that match against the All Blacks. It was a mind-blowing pass to Tim Horan. Liner had kicked the ball in behind and Campese ran onto it. He weaved left and right and then goose-stepped back inside, creating a vital bit of space on the right flank. Then Campese makes his pass. It was later dubbed a miracle pass. And to the untrained eye, it just looks like a bit of a Hail Mary. But it had intent and Campisi had a sense of where it was going, which was straight into Horan's hands. Here's the call of that oh, moment. Jones takes it out. Liner, little chip ahead. Horan's going to chase that, so's Campisi. Campisi gets it in his hands. Campisi, David Campisi, dodging both ways and feeding Tim Horan. A marvellous try, and it all came from that man, David Campese, yet again. This once again a brilliant piece of running from David Campese. This time the option from Liner was just to put the kick behind the defence with plenty of men chasing. I think once it got into uh, Campese's hands, he had the defence running backwards while it was going to be very hard to stop him. Nick Farr Jones says that moment was a typical Campese play. The way to actually support David was you had to be in depth. You, you couldn't be lateral to him because he could run away from you so easily. And and so the way to just support him was you get in behind him, maybe three or four metres behind him, so that when he did make you know the next jinking run, you could actually follow him and stay in contact. And that's exactly what he did when, he, when Tim scored that second try. So, look, he, he was unique. While on-field life seemed effortless for Campese, off-field could be difficult. And as captain, Nick Farr-Jones happily admits he had his work cut out for him when it came to Campo, because Campo was different. I actually think, when I think back to the five years that I captained the Wallabies, I reckon the most important aspect of my captaincy was getting the best out of David. Because he was, I've used the word a few times, but he was a unique person. He was totally different. He didn't drink beer. He might occasionally go out and have a Kahlua at the bar. He always sat up the front of the bar, of the bus. He was always the first off the bus. Um, he was always the last off the field because people forget that, you know, he would always stay on the field to sign autographs. He was always one of the last off the training field because people just thought he was a genius, but he worked his butt off as well. But he didn't really get on with a number of the players. Like Far Jones said... He didn't get on with a few players, and one of them was in that holy trinity. I mean, I do remember at the beginning of the 91 World Cup having to pull the other two members of the holy trinity together in the bar before dinner and trying to work out what was going wrong. Um, how come you two guys aren't communicating? We're supposed to be the leaders of this team. We're supposed to be the most experienced. you got Tim Hoare and Jason Little, Marty Roebuck. Um, Rob, Rob Edgett and trying to work out why you guys aren't communicating and it so turned out that Campo released a book just before we went to the 91 World Cup and in that book was very critical of the Queensland style of football and the fact that Michael Liner kicked the leather off it and so Noddy being a very sensitive person read it and you know and it was on and I basically said to the two I said guys you're never going to be the best friends um, but we are the most experienced guys in this team we have to lead by example coexist for the next six weeks, which basically they did. Liner and Campisi did coexist. That Far Jones peace meeting worked. The Wallabies won that World Cup. Campisi was rightfully made the player of the tournament. 
There's a great photo of Far Jones and Campo joyously holding up the Webb Alice trophy together. Far Jones can be seen in that footage, mouthing, wow. The Australian's chief rugby writer, Wayne Smith, has been covering the game since 1971. And he says Campo electrified the game like no other player before. He did wonderful things for Australian rugby. There's no question about it. Um, he brought that flair and innovation. And and as as Bob Dwyer said, look, his his head doesn't know where his feet are taking him. So uh, it was everything he did was a surprise for everyone, including himself. Um, but he he brought a, a dimension to the game that I I think inspired people around the world. You. You see so many uh, teams picked by great players. You know, they're, they're all-time best best 15, almost invariably uh, Campos uh, in the side. So he, uh, he, he probably was, um, you know, the transition period from, from uh, the old to the new. Um, but uh, he, certainly, he certainly did. Uh, Australian rugby owes him a great debt. Campo had a lot of tricks but his signature was the goose step. He'd slow down, bounce up, then explode in a new direction, mystifying defenders and wowing crowds. It's a bit of a showboat move, but it's stuck. And today, you'll still see some of the world's best players pull it out when they get the chance. What did it feel like nailing a goose step? Well, what's, what's interesting, I did it when I was eight years old, first time when I was in Yass, playing rugby league. I got the ball, two kids come at me, did something, scored the other end. These two kids are collided heads. I think, oh, well, that worked. Never practised, never training, just had it. Um, I wish I painted it, though. People use it now more than I did. Campisi was setting the world on fire when he played. While Campisi was clearly naturally talented, he says his father, who migrated here in 1955 from Italy, instilled in him a tough work ethic. Campisi says he doesn't recall his dad ever taking a day off. But he also admits his dad was not a rugby man or a rugby fan. His parents barely watched him play. My dad, unfortunately, didn't know much about rugby. I think he came to about two test matches. Didn't really understand. Uh, my mum came to about three. So, you know, they weren't, you know... I, I mean, I would go to the World Cup 91. I'd go straight back to Italy for six months. I'd come home after six months. Mum said, what was the World Cup like? Oh, that was six months ago, Mum. Moved on. <laughs> you know? That was the saddest because I'd moved on and I just went straight back to Italy and played and kept on playing on. So Campo would retire in 1996. He had that coffee and sportswear shop down in the rocks, the one Russell Crowe would sometimes visit. He then resided overseas in South Africa, where he was a skills coach at the Natal Sharks, and then he returned to Australia a few years ago. Campo has seen the game at its best and is saddened by where it is at today. How did we get to here? Oh, I can say, I think sometimes when you win, you forget where you've come from. You know, we won two World Cups. We were very great, 91-99. I mean, I suppose also a lot of those players not not giving back into the game back then, you know? And I think the off the field was more about moving forward instead of realising what you achieved, you know? Because if you think about them, we were the first team to win two World Cups. You wouldn't have known that. Now we still have one, have one, we've won two World Cups. New Zealand's won, what, three? No, they won f- uh, four, haven't they? Four, three. And South Africa's won three. We were the first to win, to get to two. And then we're just like, okay, that's enough. We'll move, forget about that. I don't know why. Yeah. I actually don't know. Maybe, I don't know, it could be the people on the board back then. I don't know. But there's been, there's just been a problem with trying to promote the game. You know, you've got a lot of private schools where Aussie rules dominating. You can't play for your country in Aussie rules or rugby league. You can't go to the Commonwealth Games or Olympic Games. Even my daughter's school, um, I won't mention, I said, well, why aren't we playing sevens? We're, oh, no, no, because the, the school system, ICSA, you know, they pick a certain amount of schools. This is an Olympic sports. Everywhere in the world, the third world countries... They get money from the game if you're in the Olympic sport. But in Australia, we're in Olympic sport. Oh, no, we're not going to play. We'll play Aussie rules. You can't play for your country. Bizarre. I don't understand why we don't push that. I was fortunate to go to the Commonwealth Games in 90. I was captain. We won a bronze medal. Unbelievable. So excited to be there. And now 
No, we've got Aussie rules in there. You can't play. You, you can't go anywhere. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre. Only, only in Australia we do things like this. Today, the code has fallen so hard that some people are saying the game is dead. So, who killed rugby union? Well, I don't think rugby union's dead, right? So if it's not dead, no one's killed it. It's taken a few um, hits, without a doubt, a few cuts, but it's also had some great wins as well over the time. Well, I'm not talking just about on the, fi- on the field. So, But I certainly don't prescribe to the fact that the game is dead. That was Michael Checker, the former Wallabies coach. You'll be hearing a lot from him, plus a lot of other big names. We've got a former PM, a billionaire, an Olympic chief, a bunch of Wallaby captains, all the big wigs, and Jeff from Bundaberg, who sums it up best. So Campo says to me that when he has, you know, done clinics in the past, over the last yeah. couple of years, is that kids now sort of struggle to name a Wallaby. What have you found? Oh, most definitely. Funny, the only one that they know is Israel Folau, and he's now gone. Next episode on The Breakdown, the rugby party that got very loose and the secret plans to take over rugby league. I'm Jessica Halloran and this podcast was produced by Claire Harvey with special thanks to Dylan Adams, Grace Richardson, Eric George, Stephen Samuelson, Wally Mason and Nick Adams Jasper. The Breakdown is made possible by subscribers to The Australian. Subscribers can hear the full series now via The Australian app. You can follow our coverage and discover more about the series at theaustralian.com.au slash thebreakdown.